Gingrich's chemistry professor must have written a very persuasive letter because Owen ended up working for Harlow Shapley that summer. So I suppose it was inevitable that he would come to Harvard for his graduate studies, which he finished with a thesis in 1961 on the cutting edge of those days, involving the latest in computer technology on constructing model stellar atmospheres. And that was the summer that I first met Owen. just before he handed in his thesis, helping him with figures. Now, remember, this was before the time of Xerox machines, so it wasn't as easy to have figures in those days. Owen had had considerable experience teaching, both at Wellesley. That's your finger that's doing. So when an unexpected opportunity opened up in 1964 to take on NatSci 9, the astronomy course in general education, he did so. And that began a long tenure of involvement teaching NatSci 9 and then its successor course, Science A17 and T17. And I think there's a connection between teaching uh, poets and English majors and having an interest in the history and philosophy of science. And Owen soon turned some of his attention to uh, projects in the history of science. One that caught a lot of attention early on was called The Computer versus Kepler, in which Owen um, programmed some of the laborious calculations that Johannes Kepler had been doing, and showed that poor Johannes was plagued by arithmetic mistakes, and something that should have converged in five or six iterations took 95. <laughs> Owen has a remarkable wide range of publications, almost a couple dozen books, more than 500 articles if you count essays and reviews, but only 332 of those are indexed in the ADS, because many of them in uh, journals that the ADS doesn't know about. <laughs> I suppose uh, sooner or later, all historians of science and astronomy have to turn their attention to the Copernican Revolution. Owen had a wonderful idea about how to investigate the reaction of contemporary readers of Copernicus's book. What you do is you go look at them and see what the readers have written in the margins. Now, can you think of a more marvelous gimmick, a better excuse for travel than all of you? <laughs> so here's a cartoon which I love to show. With apologies to the New Yorker. Owen Gingrich and his brilliant, though as yet unpublished, Copernican census. <laughs> this is the last time I will show this cartoon. <laughs> because the book is printed and is ready for shipping later this month. And I think you may, if you uh, listen carefully, notice some insights from this uh, Copernican census in today's talk uh, on the Copernican Revolution Revisited. Five minutes, Dave. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. I'm thinking back to some months ago when Don Goldsmith was here from Berkeley, uh, came up unexpectedly to my office just as a couple of visitors were leaving, and he said, uh, hey, uh, what's up? What's going on here? And I uh, feigned uh, innocence, and I said, oh, what's uh, so special? Well, he said, most academic visitors who come uh, don't have revolvers in their pockets. <laughs> uh, oh, I said, well, I didn't notice. Uh, I said, that was the FBI, uh, where uh, uh, they were listening in as I talked to a suspect in a stolen Copernicus book case. Uh, but the book appears to be in Moscow, and so it doesn't appear to be within their jurisdiction. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to leave that one hanging. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you today is a very tangled tale, and I'm going to give you a series of vignettes that come out of it, uh, and gradually they'll get threaded together, uh, but maybe not in the most logical or historical 
uh, order. I dug out my research proposal for 1971 to 92, 91 to 92, exactly 10 years ago. And I wrote, the principal goal for 1990 to 91 will be to finalize the camera-ready copy for the Copernican <laughs> Center. <laughs> Enormous progress was made this year so that the end is truly in sight. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> here we are. Uh, December 2001, I just uh, 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 emailed the publisher in Leiden this morning to find out where we're at. And he said the finished copies are expected there uh, next Tuesday. Uh, so uh, this account of 277 copies of the first edition of Copernicus's book and 324 of the second edition uh, is finally uh, coming, coming out. Now, when I said that enormous progress was made this past year back there, in 1990 when I was writing that was because one of the great stumbling blocks to publishing the census had finally been overcome. A librarian at the Lenin State Library in Moscow had mistakenly shown a visitor all of their copies of Copernicus, three of the first edition and three of the second. And I had tried very hard to see all six of these copies and no matter how hard I tried, I could only see five of them. Uh, and when I asked for a microfilm of the sixth one, they always sent a microfilm of the wrong copy, one I'd already seen. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, they told me, you know, it's in conservation, you can't see it. Finally, Miriam said, look, here's this article in the American Scholar. It tells what excuses the Russians use when they don't want you to see something. And that's the line you've been getting. Uh, so there's something wrong there. Well, then in, uh, uh, in December, there came a message from Moscow. At this time, the wall had crumbled, the Soviet Union was crumbling, uh, and the message said, if you want to see the sixth Copernicus book, come now. You'll be our guest if you can come. Well, it seemed to me kind of crazy to spend that much money just to fly to Moscow. On the other hand, I decided, what an interesting time to go to see what things are like there. The Gulf War began. The travel office begged me not to travel. I figured this is one of the safest times to travel. <laughs> Security will be very high, <laughs> as it was. And there were lots of sleep seats to sleep on. Uh, and I saw the book within 24 hours and realized that it had never needed conservation. Uh, so what was the problem? And then when the young postdoc who'd taken me to the library said that he had gone there the previous day to make sure I could see it and had been quizzed as to whether I really had permission to see the book, uh, I, my suspicions were quite aroused and I asked my host, what's going on? And he said rather sheepishly, well, by the Geneva Conventions, some books that we've taken from East Germany should be returned as cultural treasures. And this particular library, the Leopoldiana in Halle, they had just, I guess, backed up a truck and loaded it up. Uh, and to, so they didn't want foreigners messing around in some of the classifications. Uh, in fact, it was a very interesting copy. It had been annotated by Herbert von Hohenberg, the Chancellor of Bavaria, and one of Kepler's uh, frequent correspondents. Uh, very, very uh, extensively annotated uh, by that uh, nobleman and uh, diplomat. Uh, so that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, Having seen that book finally, in some ways, I was ready to move ahead with that publication. It wasn't as if I had been working on this for, for decades without doing anything. Uh, I, in 1973, I published a paper called Heliocentrism as Model and Reality. That was the great Copernican quinquecentennial year, and Donald Menzel had invited me to come down to the American Philosophical Society to join in 
with a uh, Copernican special session, and in due time, the Philosophical Society awarded me their prize for the paper, the John Lewis Prize, given for revealing some truth to the society. <laughs> uh, then, uh, uh, in, in due time, uh, we did an, another publication. I did it jointly with Robert Westman of UCLA at that time, called The Vidic Connection, uh, Conflict and Priority in Late 16th Century Cosmology. You see, in the Copernican year, the Czechs had put out this splendid facsimile of a second edition of Copernicus, uh, and some of you can see on the cover, it says Copernicus Brahi de Revolutionibus, and they had supposed for a long time that the rich uh, numbers of marginalia throughout the book was, it, was done by Tycho Brahe. And it took some time to show that, in fact, this and three other copies with the same handwriting were not done by Tycho at all, but by a young wandering tutor from Braslav who had in fact visited the island of Wien uh, with Tycho and had shown him some of the cosmological diagrams at the back of one of his copies. Uh, it was, must have spurred Tycho's own cosmological interests and after Tycho discovered that young Wittig, Paul Wittig, had died, uh, he spent 10 years trying to buy Wittig's library and finally <coughs> succeeded in getting it so that the original copy of this book is now part of the Tycho, the fragment of the Tycho library that remains there in Prague, but not annotated by him. And then uh, in 1994, I wrote a paper with uh, Jerzy Dobczycki entitled The Master of the 1550 Radices, uh, Radices Jo Francus Ophusius. 1994, if I hadn't missed the plane in Oklahoma City, I might never have solved that particular mystery. Uh, somehow, I read the, the schedule wrong, and I had the time for when the plane was departing from Dallas instead of the connecting from <coughs> Oklahoma City. So I figured I had lots of time, and I was there at the university for a, in uh, Norman for a, uh, a special uh, symposium. And my friend Robert Westman said, you know, they're opening the rare book library for me on Sunday morning so that I can go and look at some things. Well, I looked at my schedule. I said, well, I've got Sunday morning free. I'll come along, too, and I'll look at the Copernicus book. I'd seen it before, but I wasn't as sophisticated when I saw it the first time. You see, as a result of looking at so many books, I found a group of them where in the single most complicated section of Copernicus's book, which was dealing with the motion of the moon, and this is tricky because the moon is sufficiently close that you get a substantial parallax for it so that by the time you have the moon down towards the horizon, it changes the position by a whole degree. And if you're trying to get a theory of the moon that uh, uh, is going to be measured with an error of some minutes of arc, you've got to worry about things like that, and the geometry gets very messy. And this particular <coughs> application was very, very critical of how Copernicus had handled the problem. Uh, it went on at great length across the top of the page and down the side, and it said, I have noticed this. Uh, the problem is I had seven copies in seven different handwritings, all saying in first person, I have noticed this. Uh, so would the real person please stand up? Throughout the book, there were first person annotations, ego this and that, and uh, always the same in all of the copies. Copies which were spread very, very widely. One in Pisa, uh, one in Soissons, two in Paris, one in Ann Arbor, uh, uh, one in Debrecen in Hungary, uh, scattered around. Who could it possibly be? And this was another problem bugging me. You see, the paper came out in 1994, so in 1990, 
91, when I said we were so close to being finished, I still had this nagging mystery. What about all these copies of the book? What I saw at the library in Norman, Oklahoma that Sunday morning was the realization that, wait a minute, here is an eighth copy with this same set of annotations in it. But there was a difference. In a couple of the places, the word ego had been substituted, and it said Vesalius. Well, now everybody knows that Vesalius was a very famous anatomist. And was he ever doing anything in astronomy, annotating something like this very important part of Copernicus's book? It seemed very unlikely. But I looked into Vesalius's biography and found that there was indeed a substantial part missing where we don't know where he was. But it wasn't that Vesalius. Uh, uh, Vesalius turns out to be a toponym. Now, many of you know uh, of pseudonyms, but a toponym is when you take your place name, like Redicus, the young disciple who had gone up to uh, Poland to persuade Copernicus to publish his book. Uh, Redicus, uh, well, came from a revolutionary family. His father, had been accused of sorcery and was beheaded. And young Redicus was no, not allowed to use the family name Isolin anymore. And so he took uh, the name of Raetia, the pro province in Austria where he had come from. So Vesalius turns out to be a toponym for somebody from Basel in the Lower Rhine. And a little bit more sleuthing with Jerzy Dobczycki's uh, help in guessing here is that it was this man, Iofrancus Ophusius. Ophusius is a sort of uh, uh, local uh, dialect for Eberhausen, uh, which is a town along the Lower Rhine, very near Basel. So whoever it was who was copying the annotations knew not only who had written them, but knew enough about him to call him by uh, this location. So we got that one straightened out, and that was, uh, uh, that was fascinating uh, to trace where Ophusius had been. He was running an atelier in Paris in the 1550s. Before that, we hadn't a clue that anybody was seriously studying Copernicus's book in Paris or in France. There were lots of people dotted around in Germany who were studying it, but here is somebody who obviously had students, students who were copying out his annotations in very great detail. Uh, so, at any rate, what I went on to say in this uh, report uh, is that uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, do some other writing, uh, and I hope to complete the book nobody read a book on my Copernican chase. Well, that's what I still hope to complete in the next year. Uh, I, that title is based on what Arthur Kessler said in The Sleepwalkers about Copernicus's book, De Revolutionibus. Uh, he said it was an all-time worst seller and the book nobody read. Uh, so uh, having used up the title, The Great Copernican Chase, in my anthology of other essays, I had to fi figure out another title and whether the publisher will agree to go with that. I mean, they can <coughs> sort of shudder at the thought of a great stack of unbought books in the bookstore <laughs> and titled The Book No Read. <laughs> uh, I, but I know how I'm going to start it. I'm going to start the book uh, with me in a very unfamiliar kind of location, namely in Federal District Court in Washington, D.C., in the witness box, uh, where, the, where there is a stolen Copernicus book, going, a trial uh, about to begin. Uh, normally, when a book thief is caught out, uh, there is some plea bargaining. The book is quietly returned to its owner, and that's more or less it. But in this case, the thief had a security clearance for his job. And he knew if he plea bargained, he'd lose his clearance and therefore lose his job. 
So he was determined to fight it. So the uh, government prosecuting attorney asked me, well, who was this Copernicus, and why was his book in <laughs> And uh, I said, well, he uh, uh, lived at the time when uh, Columbus was uh, coming across to find America, and uh, uh, he uh, came up with this uh, radical new cosmology, which took the Earth, which everyone had assumed was fixed, and had thrown it into motion around the sun, introduced the heliocentric theory in his book, which was then published in the last year of his life, in 1543. And, of course, I was prepared to go on all morning, because I was <laughs> with a lot of news about uh, uh, And they, they, they sort of stopped me and uh, asked if I had ever seen this particular book, which they brought out and showed to me, and I looked at it very carefully, not giving any hint that the FBI had shown it to me just an hour before. <laughs> and I picked up my notes and I said, uh, well, yes, I had seen this in Philadelphia at the uh, uh, Franklin Institute, uh, and I recognized it because these books were sold paperback, no, no binding. You just bought a stack of paper and you had it bound to suit your own tastes. And this particular one was bound in a very unusual way, with a kind of uh, geometric decorated paper cover. Uh, I said I had just happened to have brought with me the two book plates from the Franklin Institute, one vertical, one horizontal, and uh, my, how interesting to notice that they fit exactly on these two gummed rectangles inside the front cover, like uh, keys in a lock. And I gave additional evidence to show that this book was, in fact, the one from the Franklin Institute. Uh, I suppose the high point of the trial came when, well, this was a second edition of the book. Uh, the thief had, had, uh, had been very clever. He had held it for seven years so that the statute of limitations ran out for a felony. But then he made a mistake. He took it from his home in Maryland to a book dealer in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. to sell, and that started the clock running again because of knowingly carrying stolen property worth more than $5,000 across a state line. Uh, so the question is, was it worth more than $5,000? The thief had asked $7,500, and that's what, how it had been advertised. Uh, seemed, seemed rather reasonable. Uh, I was asked how much the book was worth, and the uh, defense objected that I wasn't competent to answer that. Uh, the judge overruled him, and so I indicated that I thought it was worth more than that. And in the cross-examination, I was asked if I had ever taken a course in book evaluation. <laughs> I said no, but I was professor of history of science at Harvard and had never taken a course in history of science. The defense lawyer said, just answer my question. <laughs> And the judge, in a stage whisper, said, he's trying to. <laughs> anyway, what shall I say? The thief was, uh, uh, was convicted, and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he lost his job because of losing his security clearance. And uh, his wife, who apparently didn't know anything about all this that was going on, walked out. Uh, so he was pretty well destroyed. His problem, of course, was picking the wrong book to steal. Uh, you have to ask how it was that I uh, ended up being such an expert about this on the Copernicus book. So I better give you just a little bit of background. And if we can turn down the lights and the first slide, I'll show you how it all started. Here we are at the uh, some of you will perhaps recognize that uh, as the uh, Royal Observatory Edinburgh. And it's the only great astronomical establishment I know of that owes its edifice to a rare book collection. Uh, 
the uh, Earl of Crawford was uh, had a private observatory, and uh, which was the envy of many professionals in Britain, and he was getting less interested in astronomy and more interested in collecting rare books, and so he decided he would give the all of his instruments and the astronomical part of his library to uh, the Scottish nation. The implication being that they had better appoint an astronomer royal of Scotland, uh, which was in fact promptly done. So in this library, there is a marvelous collection of rare astronomical editions. I was over there on a sabbatical leave from Smithsonian, a generous policy which was in effect back there in 1970. And on the way up to Edinburgh, uh, I had a conversation with another Copernican scholar, sort of following in the line of Kessler about how few people had read the book. And we decided that, well, maybe there are more people alive today who've read De Revolutionibus in great books, courses, or whatever, than in all of the 16th century. And we thought we could count on the fingers of two hands those possible candidates for having read it carefully uh, during the 1500s. So that when I got to the uh, observatory and looked at the copy of Copernicus's book, I was rather dumbfounded to find that it was elegantly annotated from beginning to end. And if there were that few perceptive readers, it seemed like a very unlikely happening. It's also very interesting to see something about the book. What the annotator wrote on the front page is the axiom of astronomy. Celestial motion is uniform and circular or composed of uniform and circular parts. Something that I want to come back to presently, but let's say it struck me as being unusual because what we think is so important about the book is the heliocentric cosmology. And he doesn't say anything like this crazy guy throws the earth into dizzy motion, uh, but he talks about circles and circular motion. And if you don't believe that central the way he's thinking about it, you can look inside the book and see the famous heliocentric diagram and hardly any annotations. But when you get back into the technical section, which deals with circles and circles on circles, uh, he is just absolutely filled with explanatory commentary. Well, it turned out that we identified this book as belonging to one of those handful of people that I had mentioned just a couple of nights before. It belonged to Erasmus Reinhold a name that's not exactly a household word, but he was uh, the leading astronomical pedagogue in the generation following Copernicus. He was the professor of astronomy, the senior professor of astronomy at the Central Lutheran University at Wittenberg. And so this was so extraordinarily interesting to see uh, the details of how somebody at that time was looking at Copernicus's book, I decided that, well, if I should need to have some new topic to talk about during the great quinquicentennial year in 1973, maybe I should start looking at other copies of the book and see what people wrote in the margins. Maybe I'd get an idea of exactly how people were thinking during the 16th century. And so that became the uh, pattern of what I was looking for. Uh, I started searching, and I don't have time to give you the details of how you go, to go about finding copies of the book. It's, uh, uh, it requires writing a lot of letters, talking to collectors, to book dealers, uh, getting uh, publicity for the project so that people know you're doing that and point out to you that there are books to be found in strange and unusual places. And I could tell you about some of those unusual places as well, but I will definitely run out of time if I do that. Suffice it to say, I started personally surveying the copies of the book, uh, looking uh, wherever I could find them and crisscrossing Europe 
uh, and uh, uh, the U.S. to see the copies and to look at them to see what was written in them. And now that detail has uh, gone off to uh, Brill in uh, uh, Leiden, and it was done all from uh, camera-ready copy. So here is the uh, title page of it, Xerox and so on. It's reduced to 90% of this size, uh, but it's a good enough size so that the plates that show a lot of the annotations are almost at full scale. Let me cut to the chase. What is the bottom line of doing all of this search for so many copies of the book? Well, for starters, I certainly proved that Kessler was wrong. Uh, it was not the book that nobody read, and uh, it was, in fact, in sort of every major library that uh, counted itself, uh, took itself seriously. And here's what I wrote some time back when I was writing about uh, this book as an example of Renaissance scientific printing. Copies were owned by the Venetian music theoretician Giuseppe Zarlino, by the Escorial architect Juan de Carrara, by the Pleiad Pontus de Tallard, by humanists Johannes Sambucas and Pietro Francesco Giambiolari, by the antiquaries John Aubrey and William Canton, by the financier Johann Jakob Fugger, who bankrupted himself by his book collecting, uh, <laughs> by uh, Henry II, Philip II, George II, Sigmund, Sigismund II Augustus, Count Egmont, Elector Otto Heinrich, and by Duke August, whose library at Wolfenbüttel was the finest in Europe in the early 18th century, by Saint Aloysius Gonzaga, by Giordano Bruno, by Thomas Diggs, Tycho Brahe, Galileo, and Kepler, and a host of lesser known medical doctors, astrologers, and dilettantes. The royalty did not annotate their books, uh, but uh, many others did, leaving behind a precious record of the way in which the book was perceived and used during the scientific renaissance. Well, secondly, I have to say, what turned out to be unexpected was that almost any time you get a major annotation in the book, or a major series of annotations, it doesn't come singly that some student copied it out, and maybe a student of that student copied it out again, so that they come in, in great clusters. And this then leads to a great understanding of the network and the interconnections. For example, I mentioned uh, Joffrancus Ophusius, the man with his atelier in Paris in the 1550s. And those copies got spread around, but it turns out that his criticism of Copernicus was very ill-founded. And now you go into a different cluster, the, those annotated by Paul Wittig and by the students who copied out his <coughs> notes, you find that in that same place, in a couple of places where Ophusius launched his criticisms, there are detailed notes in Wittig's copies, picking up on that, not mentioning where he's doing it from, and uh, but going through the calculation and uh, uh, showing that, oh, after all, it was okay what Copernicus did. But it was obviously in response, so that even Paul Wittig knew about this other family of annotations. Paul Wittig's copies of the books were founded upon the annotations that Erasmus Reinhold put in his, because he had bought a copy in which some anonymous soul had copied out in great detail what Reinhold had. So that if you look at the Reinhold copies, there are at least a dozen that show the traces that way in this kind of network. There's another group of annotations uh, which uh, was very, uh, interesting uh, to see, and that is uh, the censorship from the Roman Inquisition, which came about as part of the Galileo affair. Um, now, what's interesting about it is that this was considered so sensitive an issue 
the, the Inquisition did not want to ban Copernicus's book because it had observations in it which they supposed would be useful for future calendar reform. And they considered this their private domain and therefore they wanted them. But they also knew they couldn't get the heliocentrism out of the book. So they figured on yet another line and that was to make the book appear hypothetical wherever it seemed to have uh, too much a definitive approach as if this is the way the universe was actually made. So here's a typical example. What was also interesting was that they specified exactly what 10 places needed to be changed. And so they had started in on the index in the 16th century in specifying pretty much how books should be corrected. That information was normally given in a separate set of books. And the index itself, as people normally got it, had the corrections only for this one book, Copernicus's book. Let me show you another copy that's censored on exactly this same place. And you will see that this one is quite different because it, you can still read the original. Uh, oh, this is Galileo Galilei's copy. <laughs> he was being on, on uh, that good behavior to censor his book. It's just that he still wanted to read it. <laughs> uh, here's a very interesting kind of example of what was being censored. This is the end of the great cosmological chapter where Copernicus explains what a heliocentric system will get for you. And he explains about the uh, retrograde motion of the planets, why Saturn's is smaller than Jupiter because it's so far, much farther away, and the stars themselves don't show retrograde motion because they're so far away, so vast, without any question, is the divine handiwork of the almighty creator. Now you may wonder why Rome objected to such a pious statement, <laughs> but think about it. Copernicus is essentially saying, this is how God created the universe, and that won't do. The next one is entitled, On the Explication of the Threefold Motion of the Earth. And that's changed to read on the hypothesis of the threefold motion of the Earth and its explication. Uh, so you can see the type of sensory uh, which was in effect. This map shows with the shaded symbols the books that were censored. I have moved the books back to their locations in uh, 1620 when the decree came out uh, showing how it was to be corrected. And you'll notice very strikingly that virtually all the censorship is being done in Italy. That there's no censoring taking place here in Iberia. All of these clerical Catholic libraries in uh, uh, France are cheerfully ignoring it. Uh, so you can see that it was uh, essentially uh, viewed as a local Italian imbroglio and they were having nothing to do with it outside, uh, which is, I think, a very interesting uh, insight into what was going on in the, in the Galileo affair. Well, those are some of the uh, interesting results which I have got from doing this, but I would like to stand back from the project and ask a little bit more about uh, what it is that uh, had uh, that uh, we learned from something like this. And so let me read to you a section from uh, something I wrote before about this. I started out by remarking that for nearly 30 years, I used Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions as required reading in our introductory science course, The Astronomical Perspective. I have a certain affinity to that book because both of us uh, started out our careers in Harvard's general education program where the Copernican Revolution was a cornerstone of the uh, Nats I case study method. I've admired the way in which Kuhn laid out the vocabulary for over uh, three decades of ensuing discussion. Normal science, puzzle solving, anomaly, crisis, 
paradigm. And of course, his book has given rise to that immortal pun, uh, what did the down and out philosopher of science panhandling in Harvard Square say as Tom Kuhn emerged from the subway? Buddy, can you paradigm? <laughs> uh, David always groaned, he knew when that was coming in our lectures. Well, perhaps the greatest accomplishment of the book was to demonstrate that the road to understanding how science works is not something defined abstractly, but based on specific historical examples. I've always been amazed by the boldness with which Kuhn took very many different examples and generalized them into an overarching scheme of scientific change, how one paradigm was overthrown by another. But yet, almost from the beginning, I saw difficulties in fitting the paradigmatic example, the Copernican revolution, into his mold. Where? in Copernicus's day was the crisis. If it was a failure to predict planetary positions with sufficient accuracy, why is there almost total silence concerning the question among C Copernicus's contemporaries? And if that was the problem, Copernicus must be reckoned a colossal failure, since the improvements in his predictions were scandalously few. Were there anomalies? Yes, indeed but not recognized until well after 1543 when, he pub when Copernicus published his book. What about the role of aesthetics? It's long seemed to me that Copernicus was more driven by the beauty of astronomical models than by crises, anomalies, or specific fresh observations. Concerning the wonderful pattern revealed by the heliocentric arrangement wherein the fastest planet Mercury automatically falls closest to the sun, and lethargic Saturn was at the outermost bounds, Copernicus exclaimed, in this arrangement we discover a marvelous commensurability of the universe and an established harmonious linkage between the motion of the spheres and their sizes, which can be found in no other way. Despite the phony claims made in so much secondary literature, it was not a matter that in the Renaissance men stopped trusting in authorities, began to use their eyes, and saw the universe as it really was. There was no observational imperative, not yet, that drove men to the new astronomy. As Galileo was to remark, he couldn't admire enough those who accepted the heliocentric doctrine despite the evidence of their senses. What Copernicus had to offer were two powerful and quite independent aesthetic ideas. One was that celestial motions should be described in terms of uniform circular motion or combinations thereof. The unending, repeating motion in a circle was compellingly suitable for heavenly moment, movements where corruption and decay were never found. There was something almost sacred about this proposal and it appealed strongly to the sensitivities <coughs> of the 16th century. Unfortunately, this beautiful idea was wrong, dead wrong. It was not dumb. It was, in fact, the most intelligent way to start approximating the motions of the heavens, and it still works with Fourier series. But in Renaissance celestial mechanics, it was destined to be a dead end. Now, Copernicus's other aesthetic idea, uh, which is why De Revolutionibus is so intimately tangled up, which in De Revolutionibus is intimately tangled up with the first idea, is in fact quite independent of it. And it's the great idea that makes copies of the first edition De Revolutionibus uh, go at auction, as I saw at Sotheby's just exactly a month ago, uh, three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, it took them two minutes and 16 seconds to reach that price. I timed it with my stopwatch. <laughs> <laughs> this other great aesthetic idea was, of course, the heliocentric arrangement of the planets. But to the 16th century mind, this idea was highly suspect. To begin with, it required new physics. Now, you can recall colloquium speakers in this very room who have heard to say in scornful tones, 
that would require new physics. <laughs> Building a new scaffolding to replace the neatly dovetailed Aristotelian physics would require more than a generation of inspired work. As Tycho Brahe said, the Copernican doctrine nowhere offends the principles of mathematics. That is, the aesthetic idea number one is just fine. But it throws the earth, a lazy, sluggish body, unfit for motion, into action as swift as the ethereal torches, the stars themselves. But it wasn't just new physics that made the new cosmology seem radical and dangerous. Tycho always said that Copernicus offended both physics and the Holy Scriptures, and always in that order. Passages such as Psalm 104, the Lord God laid the foundation of the earth that it not be moved forever, seem to call for a firmly fixed earth. Copernicus's heliocentric vision was seen as a challenge to the traditional sacred geography of hell and the bowels of the earth and heaven not far beyond the sphere of fixed stars. And hence, it generated the pervasive unease touching even those who would never worry about mere physics. Because today, Copernicus's heliocentrism, his second aesthetic idea endures, while the first, celestial motion is uniform and circular or composed of uniform and circular parts, has faded away into obscurity, it's easy to overlook the seductive power of uniform circular motion in the 16th century which you saw on the title page of Erasmus Reinhold's copy of the book, that first one that I uh, went after. Then, as I indicated, among the other copies I saw uh, was the group that belonged to Paul Vitt. And here is the front cover of, I mean, the front title page of one of those copies. And you notice that he had access to what uh, uh, Reinhold had written, because it also says the axiom of astronomy. Celestial motion is uniform and circular, and all of that. And if you look in the diagrams at the back of the copy, this is the one that's in the Vatican Library, you see uh, there's a lot of heavy work going on here in trying to get the whole thing framed in terms of circles. And finally, when he put it all together, you see something unusual. Uh, it says, uh, let me see if I focus it a little better. Underneath, first of all, you'll notice that Terra is in the middle with the moon going around, so it's back to a geocentric system. Here is the sun carrying an orbit around it, Mercury and Venus, and then circles carefully made so they won't bump. Uh, <laughs> and wrong, therefore. Uh, it says the spheres of revolution uh, accommodated from the hypotheses of Copernicus to an immobile Earth. Wait a minute. Isn't Copernicus all about a moving Earth? How can this be the hypotheses of Copernicus and you have a fixed Earth? This is because Vitic is thinking in terms of celestial motion is composed of uniform and circular motion, and he thinks that is what Copernicus is basically about. And if you don't fully believe that, you just have to look at the other books that were published during the 16th century. There was no enthusiastic heliocentric treatise from the time of Copernicus's book in 1543 until 1596 when Kepler published his Mysterium Cosmographica. In between, you get books like this, uh, published by uh, Conrad Dasipodius, the man famous for uh, fixing up the great astronomical clock in the Strasbourg Cathedral. And if you look inside it, what it has to do with is how to treat the little circles in various Copernican ways. It's kind of interesting that right after he published that book, saying he didn't have any idea whose it was, but it seemed interesting, that uh, Reinhold's successor at Wittenberg uh, published 
another version of it, saying, that crook, he know full well whose it was, it was mine. Well, I basically got it from my teacher, Erasmus Reinhold, and I've added the extra stuff. And you see, it is from uh, Ptolemy and also uh, to the observations of Nicholas Copernicus. So Copernicus is mentioned, but it's strictly heliocentric. What it's about is, uh, it is about how to treat the little circles. This is, by the way, the copy in my library. I'm very proud of it. It happens to have the signature of Hermann the Landgrave of Hesse. But the experts tell me that the binding of the book is inaccurate, anachronous for his time. It would actually match with his grandfather, uh, who was uh, Wilhelm Landgrave of Hesse, who is the dedicatee of the book. And because it is in such a very fancy gopher edges and so on, I'm pretty well convinced that this must be the dedication copy that uh, Kreutzer gave to uh, Wilhelm. Here is another typical <laughs> book from that period. Uh, the most important new astronomy textbook of the 16th century, done by Christopher Clavius. Uh, this is the edition from 1581. And in the first edition, he barely mentions Copernicus, but here he does. And what he says is that, uh, well, what Copernicus shows us is that the arrangement of circles that Ptolemy used is not necessarily the only way that you can do it. In other words, he's looking at it as a kind of a model building game, not to be considered a real description of the universe, and it's something essentially that you are doing uh, to conserve this aesthetic principle of the circles. Here you see a book by Magini, the new, uh, celestial, the new theory of the celestial circles, congruent with the observations of M. Copernici, of Copernicus. Uh, and if you look inside, it, it turns out to be strictly a geocentric book, but very much concerned with how you arrange the little circles. So that's what was going on in the 16th century. Now how come wasn't there anything big about the heliocentrism? Well, basically, at that time, uh, there was no proof for the motion of the Earth. And most astronomers were simply suspending judgment <laughs> in the absence of this. They were interested in Copernicus because of the, the, of the circles, and there was the possibility of new physics, uh, but uh, uh, it uh, was not yet on the horizon. Copernicus had obviously done something interesting, but it wasn't necessarily the heliocentric hypothesis, remarkable and challenging as the unproven aesthetic notion seemed to be. Now, aesthetic ideas can be seductively wrong, and in the absence of empirical support, it's perhaps best to take a wait and see attitude. And that's the course that the overwhelming majority of the 16th century astronomers adopted. But what is unusual about the Copernican Revolution is that it took so very long. And this leaves the writers of modern secondary sources very uneasy. What was the matter with those people? Were they dumb or something? Or were they just blinded by superstition and religious orthodoxy? So that's a point that I am keen to address. And I think that it has a great deal to do with an aspect that Tom Kuhn neglected in his account of how scientific revolutions take place. So for contrast, let me turn briefly to a 20th century episode, to another beautiful aesthetic idea. Cosmologists, especially Edwin Hubble, assumed that on a large enough scale, the universe was homogeneous in space, the so-called cosmological principle. Now, why not assume that the universe was also homogeneous in time, the perfect cosmological principle? And furthermore, there was a genuine Kuhnian crisis on hand. 
Hubble's distance scale was enormously compressed by a factor of eight because of quite inadequate distances uh, to the nebulae. And this led to a huge Hubble constant and a time scale for the universe considerably shorter than the geologists would accept in evaluating the age of the Earth itself. The steady state cosmology of Hoyle and his friends was built on the aesthetic principle of homogeneity in both space and time. But made very many astronomers uneasy for precisely the same reasons that heliocentrism worried astronomers in the 16th century. Namely, it required new physics, perhaps a revision of the conservation laws and some unknown mechanism to create hydrogen atoms in the interstices of space. But it also <coughs> confounded the Judeo-Christian sensibilities that the universe needed a beginning, a moment of creation. The fact that in his 1949 BBC series, Hoyle publicized the steady state theory in the context of an in-your-face atheism did not enhance its popularity. <laughs> Yet, in a decade and a half, the steady state cosmology was dead. Why? It was the advent of new technology, in particular, radio astronomy brought a crop of new observations undreamed of when the theory had been proposed in 1948. The discovery of the cosmological nature of the quasars by Martin Schmidt in 1963, <coughs> together with the subsequent understanding of their spatial distribution and the discovery of the microwave background in 1965, both pointed to an evolving universe, a universe with a beginning that has changed decisively over time. And in 1965, Fred Hoyle published his famous recantation in Nature. And never since has the steady state cosmology been a serious contender for the affection of astronomers. A lovely aesthetic idea bit the dust in the face of empirical evidence. Well, toward the end of the 16th century, the idea of an empirical test of the heliocentric aesthetic idea gradually occurred to a few leading astronomers. One of the most interesting of these was the attempt of Tycho Brahe to distinguish between the Ptolemaic and the Copernican system by observing the diurnal parallax of Mars. That is to say, it's easier to understand this in the Copernican system, where you have the Earth rotating around. You get a baseline uh, from sunset to sunrise that is uh, of the dimension of the Earth. And, uh, if you then make the angular measurements very, very carefully, you have a chance to get Mars's distance. We know, uh, after the fact, that this was impossible to do with naked eye observations. But he assumed that the solar system was 20 times smaller than it actually is. So it was within grasp, he supposed. And so he uh, put a major observational effort into it, even built a new subterranean observatory to get better stability and protection from the wind. He designed his instruments, originally built in the balconies of his Uranaboard castle, and moved them over and reworked them to provide greater rigidity and accuracy. Let me show you two of them just so you see what I'm talking about. Uh, here is his great steel quadrant as it was mounted at Uranaboard. Uh, it sort of totters on this circle. Uh, the perspective isn't too good, but there's a triangular support that goes back there that holds it upright. It rests on these five pillars, but it was never very satisfactory there. When he moved it to the other observatory, he now provided an armature across the top, which greatly stabilized it, and then turned it in to one of his favorite instruments for getting these precise positions. Uh, well, he ultimately failed. It was too small to be seen with the naked eye. Had he been successful, the new technology of his carefully devised scales and sighting pinules would have provided the empirical evidence for the Copernican astronomy uh, almost three decades earlier than actually happened. And Tycho's reputation as an observer cosmologer would shine brilliantly in the astronomical firmament. Yet, 
From the ashes of his failed campaign, there arose like a phoenix the evident evidence that Copernicus's aesthetic principle number one had to be abandoned because with all those wonderful observations of Mars that Tycho had made in Johannes Kepler's hands, it ultimately, he ultimately showed that there was a, uh, an elliptical orbit. Well, as uh, uh, Jim Vogel has shown in his splendid new book, on the composition of Kepler's Astronomia Nova, uh, they, Kepler ultimately realized that you could handle this system uh, by circles in a Copernican way because his critic, David Fabricius, demonstrated that that could be done. So that Copernicus's first aesthetic principle was still alive. You say a daughter? was born to you of mother geometry? Kepler replied, she will be a mischievous whore who will seduce their husbands away from the many daughters uh, born of mother physics. Uh, your hypotheses will give some means of escape to the enemies of celestial physics. So here is Kepler arguing for new physics, uh, a novelty that Astronomers were still reluctant to accept until finally Newton provided a new and more consistent framework for it. But let me show you where the evidence then finally did come. It came uh, with the invention, with another new technological invention, the telescope, which made it possible to observe the phases of Venus. And it could distinguish between the Ptolemaic system in which the epicycle of Venus was always between the Earth and the Sun, and therefore you could never see Venus with a full face, a full face because it wouldn't go on the other side. But in the Copernican system, where Venus goes all the way around the Sun, you can see it either with a full face or as a crescent phase. And here are simulated Galileo's observations where at first he couldn't be sure what was going on, but as the months went on, uh, beginning here, at the beginning of August of 1610, and working up into November, eventually when he got to the crescent phase by uh, uh, January 1st, he revealed to the world through Kepler uh, that indeed uh, the Ptolemaic arrangement had to be abandoned. And this, I think, was then extremely important in bringing about the final acceptance of the uh, Copernican heliocentric idea. So what we see there in slow motion uh, is simply awaiting for the technology to catch up. Uh, why, why had that all taken so long? Uh, there were comparatively few astronomers in those days, and the pace of invention was not as swift as, as it is today. <coughs> Nevertheless, in early modern science, we can see in slow motion what can happen in a decade or less today. But it distorts the story to demand that Copernicus's contemporaries should have been able to choose and endorse the right great aesthetic idea that we know is right today only by 2020 hindsight. Instead, we should give more sympathy, sympathy to those who withheld judgment until the evidence was in hand. If we look at 20th century astronomy and consider our celestial knowledge at that century's end compared to what James Keeler, Simon Newcomb, or Edward Pickering knew at the beginning of those hundred years, we see a truly revolutionary difference. But were there paradigms overthrown? Were there anomalies and crises? Perhaps. But there's been a most remarkable building of instruments, from Mount Wilson 60-inch to the VLA and the HST, thus forging new technologies that have driven the pace of scientific discovery. The resultant accumulation of new information has made science uniquely powerful. To understand how science works, we must really understand its history. But to understand its history sometimes requires insights from science today. 
holding the mirror of the 20th century to the 16th century can show us an important element to explore, namely the role of empirical evidence in guiding scientific revolutions. And when we look carefully, we can find it. The observational data gleaned from Tycho's new instruments and Galileo's telescope provided the means to choose the right aesthetic idea from Copernicus's fertile insights. Well, I hope this reconsideration of the Copernican revolution has given you a greater appreciation of its subtly uh, textured scope, and I hope you have enjoyed my account of some of these odd and extraordinary adventures as I have dealt with the fine details of that revolution. Thank you. Anybody that wants to leave for the Christmas party can go ahead and do that. I forgot to turn on the uh, loudspeaker. I hope everybody could hear. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have time for some questions, Roseanne. Well, I was just wondering, you know, and, and you're going, you've worked with the um, first and second edition. If you go back to who was actually using these books and who had the ability to annotate them, would students of that time have had their own copies, or would they be working with their professors' copies? Would students of that time be able to read it? Would they be able to annotate it? So basically, who had access? The book was comparatively expensive. Uh, it was, uh, uh, by current standards, uh, something in the order of $200, uh, which means that you could hardly require it as a textbook for beginning uh, uh, astronomy at Wittenberg. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the last school people think that's nothing, but uh, <laughs> uh, in any event, uh, a, a Copernicus was mentioned in the advanced classes, usually for specific numerical data or for his table of signs, uh, which is one of the earliest sign tables that was published. Uh, and uh, uh, the heliocentrism barely came up within the undergraduate <coughs> curriculum. Uh, it would be mentioned as it was uh, with Kepler uh, by his teacher Michael Mestlin uh, as he was uh, going back for his uh, master's degree. Uh, it was not necessarily an easy book to find uh, so that some people uh, complained about uh, not being able to, to find a copy of it. Uh, but anybody who was an astronomy professor and took himself seriously uh, pretty much had to, had to have this book. Uh, a lot of the annotations in the book are of, are of pretty low level, what I call index notes, uh, where key words are copied in the margin from the text itself so that you can find it again later. Uh, there are a, f a reasonable number of very interestingly annotated copies. Uh, you, you showed us this one example in Galileo's book of mild censorship, and I was wondering, are there any other notable uh, annotations in his copy, or in Kepler's copy for that matter, that you could put a remark on? It was very disappointing that uh, there were no technical comments in Galileo's copy, but he was not interested in the fine details of celestial mechanics. He was interested in physical ideas and sort of the big ideas of cosmology. In Kepler's copy, it's quite different and quite interesting uh, because uh, there was a prior annotation in the book in a couple of critical places. Uh, one uh, was where uh, there was a discussion as to what is the center of the universe. Is it the center of the Earth's orbit or is it the sun itself? Because Copernicus is vague about this. And we know that Kepler took his copy of the book to show to his teacher, Michael Mestlin, and they discussed this particular point because Mestlin added in Kepler's book a little further annotation in his own handwriting. So it's plain that that was one of the triggers that uh, got 
uh, Copernicus, uh, sorry, that got uh, uh, Kepler off to a start in what he did. There is also another very interesting one, and that is where uh, Copernicus is discussing the resultant shape of the orbit when you're using the small circle as uh, and a little epicyclic as an approximation. And he says it's not, not a circle, and the annotator has written in the margin ellipse. Uh, and it's, it's rather interesting that that happens to have been the book that uh, Kepler got. The, the ellipse in Copernicus's case bows out where it should be bowing in, so it has nothing to do with the correct uh, form, but there it sits. Come back to this side. Oh, and in looking at the, you know, doing your census, did you find any patterns or surprises in the demographics of those who possessed and annotated their copies? I mean, were they of a sort of age group or a religious or um, leaning or demographic of another sort? One of the uh, questions that always comes up is how many copies were published in the first place? And we have no uh, hard evidence about that, although in comparison with some of the other important books of this time, uh, about 500 would be right. Now one way of testing that is to make a list of all the possible astronomers who should have had the book, and then to see how many of those have actually been found in the course of the census. And it comes out to being uh, approximately 40 uh, some percent. But of course, not everybody who owned the book uh, would necessarily have written his name in, or it could have been removed by the uh, uh, rebinding and so on. So that in looking at that list of who should have had it and who had it, I didn't discover any pattern that, that one group of them was uh, systematically missing. So it looks like uh, uh, just sort of across the board, uh, people would try to have a copy of it. Yeah, just a quick follow-up, what were your criteria for deciding who should have had it? Well, trying to get the names of all the astronomy professors of the 16th century. I missed a lot, of course. <laughs> Larry, you mentioned that you've traveled to, to Europe and the, uh, and the United States to see these. How far actually have the uh, Copernicus volumes been distributed? You didn't go to the South Pole, obviously. <laughs> well, and the... Is there any that weren't accessible to you? During, during the... Uh, 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 during the 1980s, uh, Japan was really flowering in the strength of the yen, and uh, more than half of the copies that came on the market went to Japan. All of the copies that went to Japan I saw uh, in Europe or America before they went. So I didn't have to go to Japan to search in the libraries, but I did go to China uh, to see the uh, copies that the uh, Jesuit missionaries had taken as part of that great mission in the 17th century. Uh, so uh, uh, th there, there is a second and a third edition there. And then later on I discovered uh, that the Catholic missionaries had taken a copy into Manila as well, not annotated, and a copy which I've not actually seen. Uh, there are uh, a couple of copies in Australia. Australian ethos was not big on buying rare books. Uh, a lot of the placement of these books uh, has come about uh, because of it being prized as an important uh, uh, early science book. For example, the Bodleian Library or Cambridge University Library did not obtain a first edition of Copernicus's book until the middle of the 19th century when they were explicitly acquired as antiquarian items. Okay, one more. Did Copernicus live to see the book published? Oh, yes. And, uh, uh, so what became of his own copy? Um, I am, uh, uh, as far as I can figure out, uh, the sheets uh, being printed in Nuremberg were sent to Copernicus as batches became available. And Copernicus then must have sent back the list of errors so that uh, 
by the time the printing was finished, they published an errata leaf, but the errata leaf only goes through the first 75% of the book. If you work it out in terms of the speed of printing and the communication to send it up to Poland and to get it back, it works out that that's about right. What's interesting is that there are um, about uh, uh, eight or ten copies of the book that have the errata marked all the way to the end of the book. So it turns out that within the uh, sort of inner circle in Nuremberg and Wittenberg, the rest of the corrections apparently became available to them and they could mark it into their copies. Uh, I, I happen to own a second edition of the book and it has those corrections marked to the end. So it is a, a, a particularly interesting copy. Uh, therefore, I think Copernicus was seeing the pages uh, as, they, uh, as the book was printed and the story is that he saw the book uh, on the day he died. But I think what that means is that the final part, which was the front matter of the book, finally reached Poland and he knew then that it was complete and he died. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.